Top of the morning to you. This is Tacky Tat. Today we are looking at another episode of Epic History TV. This is the going through the series of World War One in progression of the timeline. And again, as always, be sure to check out the original link down in the description down below for the original content creator. Go give Epic History the TV the love and support that they well deserve. And if you have any other feature video topics that you'd like to watch together here soon, let me know down in the comments below. Let's get started. Because the First World War was, uh, everyone just was itching to use all their new toys, basically. Right. And it's horrendous. Because ultimately it, it could have possibly been avoided. 1914. But who knows? The great powers of Europe are divided into two rival alliances the Triple Entente. France, Britain, and Russia, united by fear and suspicion of Germany, Europe's new strongest power. And the Triple Alliance, Germany, which fears encirclement by its rivals, Austro-Hungary, clinging on to a fragile empire, and Italy, seeking gains at French expense. The spark yeah. comes on the 28th of June, in the city of Sarajevo. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, is assassinated by a 19-year-old Slav nationalist named Gavrilo Princip. Austro-Hungary accuses its Balkan rival Serbia of having aided the assassin and sends an ultimatum demanding humiliating concessions. Serbia rejects the ultimatum. And it's, it's just devastating that it's just such, like... All of these other bigger nations have to get embroiled just because the other people are too. And I mean, heirs have, throughout history have died all the time, been assassinated. I mean, that's part of the 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 risk of rulership uh, that you always have a mark on your back, and there's always going to be someone out to get you. And the fact that yes, it's unfortunate to happen. And it's interesting on the day that it happened, like the driver just happened to take that turn and go down that street where he could have easily just went straight or not run late. And all these different things could have rippled out to not have all of these things happen. And, and Austro-Hungary declares war. The entire Within hours, world. Austrian forces are shelling Belgrade. The Russian Tsar, Nicholas II, feels honor bound to defend Serbia, a fellow Slav nation. Yeah, and of course, just because, I mean, Nicholas, he's, he's, uh, I don't know. I'll and orders the Russian army to mobilize. German Emperor Wilhelm II has... He, he like, it's commonly said that he regretted being Tsar. Uh, it just... I mean, I oh don't know. Promised his support to Austro-Hungary. A lot to be said about He it. and his generals see conflict with Russia as inevitable, and the sooner the better, as Russian strength grows year on year. Russian mobilization is used to justify German mobilization. Because Russia's really far behind, too. Like, they're, like, most of their population is, is heavily based in, like, agriculture uh, and farming like they're not they're not up to speed with the technology for example compared to Germany uh, and I don't think really anybody is really up to speed uh, with German ingenuity ingenuity of really creating stuff gears machines toys things like that like that's one thing Germans like are really good at Followed by a declaration of war on Russia. Germany knows war with Russia means war with Russia's ally, France. It has developed the Schlieffen Plan to meet this threat of a war on two fronts. First, its armies will advance rapidly through neutral Belgium to encircle and destroy French armies near Paris and win. Yeah, because they're fr like the French German border is one of the most well defended borders i think in the world uh i mean it's it's even like 
It's right up there next to the DMZ in North and South Korea, uh, possibly even more. Win a quick victory. Then its forces can move east to deal with Russia. And now that, uh, I wonder if France, now that they've been invaded by Germany twice through Belgium, I mean, I haven't been to France, but I wonder if they actually have defenses on their Belgium border now. Because, I mean, fool me once, your fault. Fool me twice, my fault. Fool me a third time. I mean, it's, it's just negligence at that point. Whose huge army will take much longer to mobilize. And so Germany declares war on France. It's a different France. time, though. Six million men are now marching to war across Europe. Because this is, like, right after the Industrial Revolution. Like, there's a lot, like, from the last major war was in the European continent and really like playground uh, it's was through the Neapolitan area was th like conquering going at war with Napoleon Bonaparte and so there's largely been peace on the on the European continent for a long time and now like things are starting to boil over people like there's just that tension in the air between just diplomatic tension between nations and I mean when people want to fight they're gonna find a way a reason to fight uh, and it's unfortunate for all the the men that had to go to war and get conscripted and really be the fodder for all of these European leaders to play war uh, but that's always kind of been the story throughout history of the king sending men to war to play their games. Italy, however, remains neutral. The terms of the Triple Alliance don't bind it to join an offensive war. The United States also declares its neutrality. President Wilson and the American public have no desire to get entangled in Europe's war. Yeah, and it's interesting, Wilson, I mean, really, Wilson kind of won the American presidency on a fluke, uh, mainly because the Republican Party, because Wilson was a Democrat, the Republican Party was split. And that's kind of where Teddy Roosevelt, because the, the Republicans didn't choose Teddy as their candidate that they were backing, he created his own party and really split the Republican vote, which splitting the right's vote led to a left victory and had Wilson get the office, and he made a, a bunch of changes. Britain is France's ally, but at first it's not clear if it will join the war against... And it's interesting to see, like, in an alternative history of how things would have went if Teddy won the vote. And if Teddy Roosevelt, because he's like the manliest man, like, and uh, if he was the one for in the presidency for when all of this went down, like if, if that would have changed anything, if America would have joined the war sooner, uh, and if that actually could have turned the tide and change things. Maybe if they were, even at the end of the war, if they were actually part of the League of Nations where there wasn't such heavy reparations on Germany after the war and if that could have prevented a second one. Or it, it just kind of spirals on in that butterfly effect from there. It's Germany. But when German troops invade Belgium, whose neutrality Britain has guaranteed, an ultimatum is sent from London to Berlin, demanding they withdraw. They've it's invaded. ignored, and Britain declares war. They're not going to retreat. A British expeditionary force lands in France, while the German invasion is held up for crucial days by Belgian resistance at the fortress city of Liège. Now, and that would be tough, I mean, that like, especially since it's it's largely a surprise attack on like coming from the Belgian perspective, where, I mean that would be tough. I mean Belgium's small, 
they they don't really stand a chance going up against Germany. Um, but what they can do is buy time, so the Allies can actually have some sort of coordination, hopefully. Um. German troops commit several massacres against Belgian civilians. The atrocities are inflated by Allied propaganda and help turn public opinion in neutral countries against Germany. France, unaware of Germany's great encircling attack, launches Plan 17, an offensive into German territory. But in the Battle of the Frontiers, they're driven back with enormous losses on both sides. The British expeditionary force clashes with the German army at Mons, but the British are heavily outnumbered and soon join the French in retreat. The Allies make their stand at the River Marne, 40 miles outside Paris. And it's, it's fairly unfortunate that Paris is so far north and largely close to the border. Um, I mean, it's it's just it's just a tricky situation because you can only pull back so far and if you lose your capital that basically eliminates the morale of your troops greatly <laughs> from them point from that point onwards uh, so it, it's really hard to stay in the fight once you lose your capital and having it so close to the border is a severe disadvantage their desperate counterattack saves the city and drives the Germans back both sides suffer a quarter of a million casualties. The race to the sea begins as both sides try to outflank each other to the north. A series of clashes leads to the First Battle of Ypres, where the Allies desperately cling on and prevent a German breakthrough. Hmm. There are more heavy losses on both sides. The two armies then dig in along the entire 350-mile front, seeking shelter from deadly machine gun fire and artillery shells. Trench warfare has begun. That, that's really the, the more horrendous part. And really what World War I is known for is the trenches. And that leads to all of these new types of new problems that are really kind of unfamiliar, in, at least in war, uh, or at least not as common up until now. Uh, just because technology has advanced so much where machine power is devastating. You can litter through entire fleets of men in seconds. And like, that's never been done before at this point, where usually at the last time there was a major war on the continent, it was going against Napoleon and you would have to stand in and musket load your your shot and have a volley and men stand in line and now this is a completely different strategy completely different game and so this is the only way to defend yourself and this leads to like largely like disease and all these different other skewed of problems <laughs> British warships win the first naval battle of the war at Heligoland Bight, including food from reaching it by sea. The aim is to bring Germany's economy to its knees and force it to surrender. But a week later, the British cruiser HMS Pathfinder becomes the first victim in history of a lethal new weapon, the submarine-launched torpedo. Yeah. German yeah, and really, I mean, it's just cause and effect, like, because they blockaded, and, like, and, of course, everybody knew, like, Britain runs the seas, they are the king of the sea, and so they had to go under the sea. German submarines, or U-boats, have a surface range of 9,000 miles, and can attack undetected from beneath the waves. They herald a deadly new challenge to Britain's command of the seas. And I mean, really, like that's pretty, that's pretty ingenious too, though. Like to be, just the concept of a submarine to just be constantly underwater and be able to stealthily attack at any moment. I mean, it, even just psychologically, 
it really would I mean it just get in the back of your head especially being a, a captain of a ship like you always know that there's just an unknown threat underneath the underneath the waves at any point if you get hit with a torpedo so on the eastern front Russian armies invade East Prussia but they blunder into disaster at the Battle of Tannenberg, where General von Hindenburg and his chief of staff, Erich Ludendorff, mastermind a brilliant German victory, taking 90,000 prisoners and destroying an entire wow. Russian army. Wow. The Russians contribute to their own defeat by transmitting uncoded wireless messages. A second yeah. massive German victory at Masurian Lakes forces the Russians into retreat. In just six weeks, the Russian army suffers nearly a third of a million casualties. Jeez. Meanwhile... Yeah, I mean, at this point, Russia's very ill-equipped for this scale of war, I feel. Well, Austro-Hungary's invasion of Serbia suffers a humiliating reverse at the Battle of Tsar. Austro-Hungary's offensive against Russia also ends in disaster and retreat with the loss of more than 300,000 men. The fortress town of Chemischul is cut off and besieged by the Russians. The Germans are forced to come to the rescue, launching a diversionary attack towards Warsaw. It leads to weeks of brutal winter fighting around the Polish city of Łódź, but there is no clear winner. Meanwhile, the Turkish Ottoman Empire has joined the Central Powers, declaring war on its old enemy, Russia. Turkish warships bombard the Russian ports of Odessa and Sevastopol, while in the Caucasus, Russian troops cross the Turkish frontier. Down in Georgia. Beyond Europe, the war rages on the world's oceans and in far-flung European colonies. German troops... Yeah, and especially like, yeah, in Africa. I mean, they got neighboring colonies of opposing sides. So, I mean, they're, they're just as much in the war as everybody else. Cross into British East Africa, modern Kenya, and occupy Tavita. While Allied forces seize the German colony of Togoland, modern Togo. But British forces invading German Cameroon are defeated at Garoa and Nsangakong. While a 3,000 strong force attacking German Southwest Africa, modern Namibia, is captured at Sanfontaine. A month later, British landings at Tanga end in chaos and defeat at the hands of a much smaller German force led by Colonel von Lettoff Vorbeck. Cut off from Germany, Letov Vorbeck goes on to wage a highly successful guerrilla war against the Allies, tying down huge numbers of troops. Yeah, I mean, he... He made a huge impact. Like, he, I've, I've, I remember his name being brought up multiple times, and, like, he was one of the main continuously victory-driven, like... He won most of the battles that he fought down in Africa. And even towards the end of the war, he kept winning while Germany and the mainland of Europe was losing miserably towards the end. In Asia, Japan honors its treaty with Britain and declares war on Germany. Japanese forces go on to seize the German naval base at Tsingtao. The German colonies of Samoa and New Guinea surrender to troops from New Zealand and Australia. But in the Pacific, off the coast of Chile, German Admiral von Spee's powerful East Asia squadron sinks two British cruisers at the Battle of Coronel. Both ships are lost with all hands. Five weeks later, he runs into a British naval task force at the Falkland Islands. Four of the five German cruisers are sunk. Von Spee goes down with his flagship. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, British troops seize control of the Ottoman port of Basra, securing access to the vital Persian oil that fuels the British fleet. I mean, 
mean, that area is like, even though it's, it's no secret um, that the Middle East has a lot of oil. Um, but I mean, that area specifically, just south of the mountains of where um, of where Iran is, just on the corner of where, I, like, Iraq. Um. That winter, Austrian troops finally capture Belgrade. But the Serbs then counterattack and drive them back once more. The fighting in Serbia has already cost around 200,000 casualties on each side. In the North Sea, German warships mount a hit-and-run raid against English coastal towns, shelling Hartlepool, Whitby oh, wow. and Scarborough, and killing more than a hundred civilians. On the western... And see, that always sucks, to just, like, shelling towns and, like, just, like, un, like, not targeting specific militant forces of the enemy and just taking it out on the citizenry, I mean, that, that sucks. And I mean, both sides do it. Everyone does it, but it just sucks. In front, the French launch their first major offensive against the German lines. But the first Battle of Champagne leads to small gains at a cost of 90,000 casualties. While in the Caucasus, an Ottoman offensive through the mountains in midwinter ends in disaster at Sarikamish. Turkish casualties total 60,000, many frozen to death. On the Western Front, that first Christmas is marked in some sectors by a short truce and yeah. games of football in no man's land. Yeah, that, the winter truce, or the Christmas truce. And because this is the first year of the war, I mean, there's not so, like, sure, they're at war, but they're not they haven't been like so entrenched in it for so long where there's actually kind of that understanding of the enemy where there's a truce a christmas truce even though some of the officers on both sides do not like it and put an end to it from this point forward i mean it, it's quite remarkable that during christmas that this actually even happened in no in no man's land and if you want to see a video on that I left a link to that down in below with some original footage uh, from Christmas Truce of No Man's Land. And yeah, go ch check it out. It's actually pretty cool. Some rare footage. The killing zone between the trenches. Again, as always, be sure to check out the original link down in the description down below for the original content creator. Go give Epic History the love and support that he well deserves. Also, keep up the series, and we'll see what happens in 1915. And again, let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.